So we will go ahead and get started. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Danielle Lynch. I'm the Assistant Director of Domestic Violence Advocacy at the YWCA. So I work largely at the Palomar Building, um, providing domestic violence services to clients who come in there. So we'll go ahead and get started. I'll introduce each of the panelists and then we'll get started. If there are any questions that you may have, feel free to put them in the chat. You can unmute yourself to ask them or if it's something that you don't feel comfortable um, asking, either unmuting yourself or kind of in the chat, um, you are also more than welcome to private message myself or, and I can ask them, relay the question. So with that, we'll get started introducing our first panelist who's Joshua Rhodes. He is a prevention education volunteer with the YWCA Oklahoma City. Josh, do you want to introduce yourself? And... Uh, hey, everybody. Yeah, my name's Josh, as Daniel said. Um, I've been volunteering at the Y for, I'm not sure what time is anymore. Um, I think maybe a couple of years now, um, working with prevention with uh, Rachel. Um, and I've been kind of talking about uh, toxic masculinity and anything to do with it for, you know, just mainly students um, and younger people. So that's me. All right, thank you, Josh. Um, the next one is Paula, and is it Schaunauer? I'm sorry, um, who is a licensed clinical social worker. And Paula, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Well, I'm Paula Sophia Schoenauer. I'm a retired Oklahoma City police officer. I retired in 2014 and um, have a lot of experience um, responding to domestics and trying to find services for victims of domestics. Uh, I'm also um, am a therapist and I specialize in identity issues and trauma resolution. And in my community practice, um, I, I advocate for the LGBTQ community and here at Oklahoma City. Awesome, thank you. And then we have Richard Stewart with Serve the People. Richard, do you wanna, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, yeah. Like I said, um, my name is Richard Stewart. I, co-founded and helped run Serve the People, as well as the HOPE Initiative and a couple other organizations. As of right now, we're the only harm reduction program that actively operates in Oklahoma City, providing Narcan supplies like that to whoever needs them. I'm also a survivor of domestic violence. I was in a, about a 12 year relationship with that. So I'm happy to answer any questions regarding that as well. Well, thank you, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started you know, with some of the questions, as mentioned, just for those of you that may have came in late. If you have questions that you would like to ask for any of our panelists, feel free to use the chat or unmute yourself if you'd like to ask. Um, if it's something that you don't feel comfortable asking via either of those platforms, you're more than welcome to private message me and I can relay that question as well. So the first question, just to kind of get the conversation started about toxic masculinity and kind of some of the roles that it plays. Um, I think it's, we have to start by asking like, what is toxic masculinity? Um, so do any of y'all want to share kind of what toxic masculinity is? I could, I could tell you what I think toxic masculinity is um it's a it's an expression of masculinity that that is is um if focused on you know the the dominance of of men over women um and also it expresses itself a lot of times um violently through um, sexual assault and rape and through the attitudes that people have, um, or men have about, um, about, about women that belittle women and gaslight women. And then 
also culturally promotes a an environment where um, violence is is more esteemed than um, dialogue. Absolutely. Does anybody have anything they want to add to that? I can, so, I can kind of take. I can kind of take it. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, technology, right? Um, I can kind of add a little bit to that. That was a great answer. Um, but just is the way I see it is it's you know not all masculinity is toxic, um, but it's the toxic side of it that leads to like <clears throat> they were saying was it's you know, it leads to the violence and all that, but it, it leads to violence against everything, uh, themselves, you know, um, you know, other men, um, everybody pretty much. So basically it's just, you know, that masculinity and being macho or whatever, just getting talked to basically, just easy, easy answer that I have, I guess. Absolutely. Um. So the next question kind of builds off that first one a little bit and just what does toxic masculinity mean to you and what are some examples that come to mind? I'll go again. Um, takes me a second for my brain to start working. Um, toxic masculinity means to me, it's, it's something that I've grown up with. It's something I know most of us have grew up with. Um, you always hear the phrase man up um, when you hurt yourself as a little child. Um, I remember being being teased as a child. We, we, we were all, you know, pretty much raised that way where, you know, don't be a girl, um, don't act like a girl, stuff like that. So um, I, I really the more I dove deeper into toxic masculinity, the more that I see I am a product of it. And to fight those things um, is, is kind of tough sometimes when you think about it and you have to stop yourself and back up and really think about what you're saying and what you're doing because, you know, growing up, that's how we were taught. Um, and knowing now how wrong that was and how uh, hurtful that was or how it, you know, changed people psychologically and, um, so that's pretty much my answer to it, as far as I can get into it right now, I guess. I like to reiterate what Joshua said is, um, growing up in the 19, you know, early 1960s, um, and, um, uh, 70s, I was, um, often teased and bullied because I couldn't quite learn how to uh, act like a boy the way the other boys were supposed to act and and then you know like especially um, athletic coaches uh, were always criticizing uh, boys um, about you know you hit like a girl you run like a girl you cry like a girl and it, there was just all this reinforcement to to be a, like a girl or to um, or to express um, your emotions um, was was something that was poisonous to um, your you know to my ability to um, blend in with the, with the guys and and, and oftentimes um, even as even as grade schoolers you know some of the guys that I remember they would refer to a, a particular a boy in the neighborhood oh he's such a woman or, or you know or something like that where it, it was something that meant he was less than and and then and then growing up um there was a encouragement from even my own father to have sex as, with as early as possible and i remember um him telling me you know he goes so when are you gonna get laid and I said, when I fall in love and she lets me, and he goes, it's not about her letting you. And I don't know what he meant by that, or I didn't back then, but I really, I realize now that 
um, that was rape. And that came from my own father. And, and then that kind of attitude prevailed in some of the, um, the, the male activities that I tried to engage with um, while I was growing up because um, whether it was in, um, in sports or whether it was when I was in college, um, I joined a fraternity that was every bit as much as like the animal house. Not all fraternities were like that, but this one was. I was in the military and even in the cadences that we sang when we ran, were, you know, were derogatory towards women so much of the time. Um, because when I was in the military, we didn't have um, women in our ranks because I was infantry and combat arms. And so um, it, it, it's just, it permeates it, even into the most trivial things that um, we did. And it just, and, and um, unfortunately, it gets reinforced over and over again. When I was a police officer, my colleagues would, uh, male colleagues would um, criticize women, um, talk about, well, so and so, I wouldn't, wouldn't want her to back me up, that kind of stuff, because she's not seen as someone who can handle the situation or, or be protective. Um, and then the, the pervasive sexual harassment. Um, that that was going on, not just toward men towards women, but men towards men in certain ways where they would be making fun of each other's manhood. One incident in particular was, uh, you know, someone photoshopped um, one of our officers' faces on a, um, um, a penthouse cover woman and, and then distributed the, uh, that, that particular picture all over the station. And um, it was all in jokes and everything, but, and then the guy, I guess, that was targeted for that thought it was funny, but that kind of stuff became, when it was tolerated that one time, it just would get even more savage from there, from then on. And it seemed like the, that my command and colleague didn't know when to do, uh, put a stop to it. Thank you for sharing. There's a lot of really good examples of just kind of how that is so intertwined and impacts a variety of ways in our society. And um, I think a lot of times we, it can be hard to realize just how broad of an impact toxic masculinity has. Um, any other things anybody wants to add for that one before we move on? So the next question, I'm also going to add the quote in, um, <clears throat> in the chat, just for if that helps you. I know I can be more of a visual person. Um, but Bell Hook said, the first act of violence that the patriarchy demands of males is not violence towards women. Instead, patriarchy demands of males that they engage in acts of psych a psychic self-mutilation that they kill off the emotional parts of themselves. What, what does this quote mean to you? And what comes to mind when you hear it? I can kind of take a stab at that one too. Um, it's funny because I was just writing some notes down as, as we're going. And, and one of the things is you're, you're taught as, you know, at least for me, I was taught as a, very small child to not show any emotions, hold them in, no crying, uh, kind of what stems back to not acting like a girl, you know, for whatever reason. Okay, we always go back to that one. But, and what that does, and, and you bottle all that in, you bottle all these, all your sadness and your worries and your stress and your, your you know, taught not to show any of those emotions. And, and then when it does come out, I know with me, um, it's anger. It's, it's, you're mad. And that's, I mean, you're cool if you, you know, punch something or do something like that. But, you know, if you cry, then you're going to, you know, be bullied or whatever it may be. So, so you can imagine people, you know, doing this for years and years and years. And, 
never having any inkling that it's okay to cry or anything like that because they're going to lose some kind of card or whatever it may be. So to me, you know, what that quote means is, you know, it's not only endangering and hurting others, it's, it's hurting themselves as well with that same kind of mindset, so. Absolutely. Anybody else have anything they want to add to that? Sure. I mean, for me, growing up in Appalachia and Kentucky, I always got the impression that things were a little bit different out there. I mean, it's mostly old mining towns, stuff like that, where toxic masculinity isn't just something we deal with. It's almost a way of life. Like, unless you're able to be violent at a young age, you're not a man. And you never will be. So for me, a lot of that was we had to kill off some certain emotions or at least never display them or allow ourselves to really even feel them to a certain point because of that and trying to be part of a society that was just toxic to very, like at the very beginning. Thank you for sharing. And then there's um, from, with that cutting off of emotions is, is that, um, that lack of, um, being able to express in ourselves ourselves as, as as whole people, and then that um, I think creates a psychic you know a psychic wound that that a lot of men um, find it difficult or impossible to recover from which to recover. And and then another thing, um, I had a train of thought with with this. Um, but I think it, I think it, pre, the, um, that severing of our, I guess, our humanity um, in, in that, in that psychic self-mutilation um, creates a, a self-consciousness in men and boys that they don't want to be found in any way to um, be like a girl, like a woman in, in any way because of the, of the stigma of the challenges that will happen. Um, and it's not just that um, this, the, these um, derogatory comments aimed at women, but they're aimed at other men. I remember, um, you know, working at a construction site and and um, some of the guys were laughing at another guy and they said he digs like a woman. I don't know how you use a shovel like a woman, I, whatever. I mean, but they were, they, they were criticizing him and he was really self-conscious after that. And, and then um, I myself, um, um, always looking at men and studying them, how do you do it right? How do you, and and I I've noticed that um, there's a lot of men that that kind of surreptitiously do that and then um, also you know with with cinema and other media um, get their messages get their scripts on how they're to perform and unfortunately um, we have so much media that is misogynistic and it just keeps reinforcing that. And that the and that that emotional cutoff and that hard heartedness um, in in order to create a, an attitude and a reputation. Absolutely. Does anybody have anything else that they want to add about that question or that quote that came to mind? We'll move on to the next question. Um, so according to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, 49% of women and 40.7% of men in Oklahoma have been experienced intimate partner violence. But society tends to make it seem as if it's rare for a male to be a victim of domestic violence, especially if um, there's a female perpetrator. Well, why do you think that is? Uh, 
I think as a society, we have, we have come to, you know, expect males or men or to not show any weakness or, or anything like that. Um, I think a lot of it's, it's just society expectations because we have somehow, you know, and I do believe it is going to get better, but it's, it's still out there a, a lot. So I think a lot of it is just the, the, the same thing of kind of what we talked about before is just holding everything in and, and, you know, don't worry about them or, or something like that. You know, I, that's just kind of my thoughts on it, I guess, but just kind of started off. But. Well, as we know that the, the domestic abuse cycle is very complex and that, that both, both abuser and victim feed into it. And that oftentimes, um, men from my experience are, are more commonly abused in domestic violence situations than um, people would imagine. Um, and, and it's not always just in retaliation for the abuse that the man um, heaped on to the woman in a, in, in, um, a relationship like that. Um, there, I've responded to calls and where there was abuse uh, of the male who was restraining himself from trying not to hit his uh, partner or lover or wife. And um, he had, you know, he had the marks on him of abuse um, that would correspond to the Domestic Abuse Act of, of, of police being able to take action on. And, and she did not have any. And when we're investigating it, um, in this one case, I'm not saying this always happens, but um, she was trying to provoke him to hit her because she wanted him to get arrested. And he knew that he didn't want to respond. And, and, and um, when she was hit on him, but he didn't want to press charges. And he was ashamed to do so. He was ashamed of, of um, being a victim of, of, of violence and almost begged us not to report it. But because of the Domestic Abuse Act, um, we, we could not just not do anything. And, um, and so, but once we were finished, you know, that evening, um, you know, he didn't go to court, he didn't cooperate in it, um, any further. Another thing is um, there's, there's a, uh, as one would expect, there's a lot of stigma um, for men who have been battered by women. And so they, they will downplay it, underreport it, um, lie about it, that they got into a fight you know, with a guy and say, you should see the other guy, those kinds of things that go on. And um, so, so there's, there's, and then there's not really as much, and especially back when I was an officer, um, there, there weren't much um, in, in the way of support systems for um, male abuse victims. And then this wasn't only uh, for um, um, female on male violence, this was also for men in same sex couples or um, men and trans women, or trans men and, and a cisgender woman. Um, the, these these, um, the, these um, life situations um, were not um, considered when a lot of these laws were being made and so, and, and then when support systems were being constructed. So, there's a lot of underreporting under -reporting in some populations. Absolutely. Any other things anyone wants to add for that question? Sure. So in my own experience, it was effectively my own toxic masculinity that prevented me from reaching out for help. And along with like where I was, there was a severe lack of resources for men in those situations. And I also, like, from a young age, I developed a reputation for the ability to commit violence. 
and now I'm able to actually use that for good, owning a security company and executive protection, stuff like that. But for the longest time, I felt like my reputation was my life in that regard. And if it came out that I was being abused by a woman, that would have hurt that. And also, just like any other, almost any other abusive relationship, my friends and family loved her. So there's always a question of, will I be believed, even if I do say anything? Yeah, and that actually is a kind of a really good segue into the next question about how toxic masculinity deters male survivors from seeking help. Anybody want to add to that or share? I can add a little bit. So, I mean, like I said, part of it was lack of resources. Will I be trusted? Like, will that, like, again, my own toxic masculinity saying, this is my own fault. I'm just not strong enough to deal with this. And also, like I said, it was a 12 year relationship. It was also my first relationship. So, even then, there was still the whole, like, isn't this normal? And plus, the emotional abuse of, I'm the only person that would ever love you anyways. So while that definitely helps, like even then, if I were to, I'm not going to reach out to the police. I've seen the way at that point that they often dealt with domestic violence situations to begin with. So I didn't really see an out other than getting myself out. And it took about nine years before I went to therapy about it. And that didn't help because that therapist was awful. But Eventually, I found people to help, got a great support system, and that kind of led to me eventually getting out of the situation. Thank you for sharing. You know, I've, seen, I've seen police officers laugh at men who have been abused by women. I mean, then talk tough to them and say, you know, you, you, you shouldn't be putting up with that stuff. And, and um, Shame in him, um, and and then you know having making jokes about it later on um, um, during you know either like on the mobile data terminals back in the day or after you know during after the ship's over and we'll talk about that and then you know one of the things about domestic violence is that um, officers are called back to addresses frequently. Um, unfortunately, and um, so these these kinds of comments um, facilitate a bias um, against the people involved in these situations, trapped in these situations a lot of times because they don't know what resources they have, or they don't have the coping skills, or the um, or the or the uh, alternative reactions to um, get out of the situation. So, um, and, 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 and people uh, often don't know what to do. And sometimes it's the authority, well, too often, the authorities aren't very, are very much helped. Uh, since 1994 with the OJ Simpson um, um, trial, there's been a, 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 a spotlight put on domestic violence and, and it's increasing more and more since then, but we're still not where we need to be. Absolutely. Anybody else have anything they wanna add for that question before we move on? Okay. So this has kind of been talked about a little bit already, but how does toxic masculinity encourage the perpetration of domestic violence? So things like keeping your woman in line come to my mind, but what kind of examples or things come to your minds? Again, in my experience, it was almost she was well aware of toxic masculinity and how it worked. So it could easily be weaponized against a man in that situation. Like just used to emasculate, knew exactly which buttons to push, 
things like that. So until like we're able to actually confront that in ourselves as men, it's also very, very easy just to use that male fragility against us as well to help perpetrate that violence against men. And then, like you said, there's so many ways that it's used to hurt femmes and other partners. Well, one thing that's the way that um, toxic masculinity is promoted in culture. Um, there's a movie that used to be um, a family favorite in my house when I was growing up called The Quiet Man with John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. I think it was early 1950s. And, um, you know, The Quiet Man is uh, John Wayne and he's a boxer who, um, without intention, killed someone in the ring. And then he goes to Ireland because that's where his ancestors are from to chill out and everything. And he's trying to get along in the with the community. And he meets Maureen O'Hara and um, the character she she played. And there's a there's an immediate spark that she's really frustrated with him because he won't act like a man. And that means put her in her place. And the the community tries to get him to fight. And finally, at the end, he does fight. And at the end, um, he turns to Maureen O'Hara and puts her in her place and violently so, and threatens to backhand her. And this is this liberation that is shown in the early 1950s on, on film. And then finally, she sees the man she wants to see. And then, um, and then they, get to, they, they get together. He's finally acting like a man and treating her like like a woman in the way that she expected to be treated and which is which which is toxic and we can we can look at um these kinds of messages all the way through the, our, our our culture and cinema and music and music videos and stuff like that 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 promote this kind of relationship and then there's the cultural um ideas of you know of putting a woman in her place that men you know put pressure on each other you know there there's there's you know you need you need not let her be like that you need to put her in her place you need to give her a good slap i mean these are things i heard growing up from um around around some of the men that that in my family and in my neighborhood about i'm talking about some women and some of it maybe maybe have been bravado but some of it for someone who um, is especially vulnerable to being thought of as weak, um, there it, it would there would be something um, where the man would finally lash out, you know, and not be the quiet man anymore. Um, and that kind of pressure, you know, from from all around. I've already mentioned that, but it's intense, and it's something that that I think it's going to take us a long time to get over that stuff because it, it, there's there's still that prevailing um, attitude. And then another thing that concerns me is the the women revenge films. So it's in, it's an inversion of the traditional roles, but these uh, women who are are, are victimized and then they go out and get revenge and and they achieve some kind of liberation through violence and and it's it's basically the same kind of message um, that have that have been pressuring men but the that it's also um, the violent the, the, the denominator the the common denominator is violence in in a lot of those films, um, and some people see those films as, "Look, this is a woman being powerful," and um, it's you know, it's at first some of those movies were refreshing, I guess, in certain ways. Um, what that Jodie Foster was in one such movie, I'm forgetting the title of it now, and. Um, 
but she, uh, but but there's been a proliferation of them here recently, and it just I think it's it's in the the basic thing is it embracing that violence, it embracing that that toxic quality of masculinity. Anyone else want to add anything to piggyback off that? Oh, I thought of the title of that Jodie Foster movie, The Brave One. Brave. Um, so the next question, um, how do you feel that violence perpetrated by a female towards a male gets minimized in our society? So thinking of things like um, the crazy ex-girlfriend or other ways that it may be kind of dismissed or minimized. Yeah, the crazy ex-girlfriend one is rough. Trying to talk about not just that one partner, but other partners who have gaslighted or even mocked that abuse, things like that. Trying to talk to people about that can often lead to just, well, you're just saying you're a crazy ex-girlfriend, so you're the actual problem here. And while those tropes absolutely do exist in our serious problem that needs to be addressed, it still definitely minimizes our ability to discuss the trauma that we faced in certain situations. Absolutely. Anyone else? Well, I'll just draw on cultural influences again. Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew. You know, there's the the, the opinionated um, and and willful and independent woman um, getting tamed and finally submitting to um, patriarchy uh, um, and being a, a perfect example. Um, they these um, and you know it makes me wonder. You know, there's that prevailing attitude. You know, a myth of the woman wants to marry you know, uh, is attracted to a bad boy and she wants to reform him. And, and I, I wonder if there's that impulse in men of attracting, you know, to, um, uh, to, to women who are wild and want to tame them um, and to try to, um, you know, have the uh, kind of relationship where he gets wildest, wildness when he wants, but other obedience uh, otherwise, and it's, and, and um, there, and these kinds of situations seem like they can become very volatile, um, where the, 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 the parties involved end up provoking each other and um, leading to a cycle of violence. Anyone else have anything that comes to mind or that they'd like to add? Yeah, sure. There's one more thing. And I feel bad because I'm sure this is going to be a question that comes up later. But while those things absolutely do exist, and like the example I already gave, we still, I think, have to view it through the lens of power structures. Like the patriarchal power structure in this country still lends itself to men obviously and so while those problems do exist it's I don't want to say valid but it makes sense as to why in a way fems wouldn't fully trust men to enter those spaces especially when like certain men already try to invade any space that has to do with women to begin with Absolutely. Anything else anyone may want to add? So the next question, we often hear people say things like, he's just a boy, he's not a man, um, or dismiss some of the behaviors like he's not a man. 
um, whenever a male perpetrates violence. In what ways do you think that this excuses like this um, enable toxic masculinity and encourage violence from men or allow it to happen? I've been quiet for a little bit, so I guess I'll an <clears throat> answer this one here uh, or put my one cent in. Um, you always hear the boys will be boys. Um, and, you know, the same thing, we, I, I think we see a common thing here is weakness, you know. Um, but when it comes to the boys will be boys thing, it's just such a forever, it's the same thing we talked about earlier is a cultural cultural thing. Can't say that word apparently. Um, but it's something that, like, I remember even my mom, you know, saying that as well. Well, you know, he's just a boy. What do you expect? You know, stuff like that. So I think a lot of that is just, it, it's been going on for so long that it's, I still hear it today. I just cannot believe it. Like, it's, you know, and, and I always, every time I hear it, I was like, but why? You know, or, you know, and if you really, like, step up and, and question when someone says that, most of the time you'll actually get a pretty good conversation out of it where they'll agree with your side of it as well and how damaging that is um, for everyone. Just like everything else we've kind of discussed, you know, it's not just for the boys, but it's everyone around that that person, you know, that's that's what makes it so toxic and, um, and brings out the violence and all that stuff. So I just think it's like everything else, it just kind of contributes to violence, you know, toward, you know, everybody around somebody that that is treated that way, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else have anything they want to add? I think that sometimes the boys will be boys motif is, um, it depends on what the target is. Because if, if um, say a fraternity and, um, hires a couple of strippers to come to their party and strip for them, and then it gets out of hand and they rape one or both of the strippers at the end of the night, and it's boys being boys. Um, and there's not, a, you know, and there's this attitude that prevails that women in that kind of profession, you know, deserve what they get. Um, but but then if if a woman is um, targeted that is considered you know a uh, a pristine example of uh, young womanhood then it, it's it it could be considered more um, egregious and maybe there's more effort to get something done um, for instance the the young woman that was murdered um, and, and um, the, all the national media that was paid attention to her. I mean, that kind of you know, young, white and pretty and, and those kinds of things. And so there seems to be more an investment in, in trying to get some kind of justice for that. But, but um, if, it was, if, if, the, if the target is um, a sex worker or a stripper or a trans woman, women of color, um, women in poverty, there just doesn't seem to be as much effort and so and then the attitude is yeah boys will be boys you know um, so she had to do something to deserve it and um those those kinds of attitudes um seem to go hand in hand in a lot of cases yeah we definitely see some pretty significant disparities with how the systems and society and law enforcement and all the different entities may work to solve certain cases or to try to get justice or the perceived justice. Um, anybody else have anything that they want to add to that question? Yeah, I was basically going to say what you just said, but to elaborate, I think that like patriarchal systems require that men not be held accountable on some level. And I, I think Brock Turner is a perfect example for that. Like, I think a lot of men saw themselves in that and therefore just gave him the ultimate pass 
to do all that shit. So again, like I think that it seems again just a lack of accountability and using that as the cop out to achieve that goal. Um, to kind of build on that, there is a country, I forget the singer at this point, but there's a country singer and the song came out, it um, infuriates me every time, but um, talks about um, knowing the difference between like a boy and a man and talks about like if, you know, he takes her home and essentially doesn't rape her, um, then he is, he's a man and that's how you know the difference. Did they leave or did they just leave? the door on or did they just sorry did he just drop her off or did he try to um sexually assault her and so when thinking about that um kind of the differences with how we look at men and how they are held accountable what comes to mind um with that just to kind of build a little bit sorry that was a very rambly question <laughs> What it brings to mind to me is um, that the difference, it goes back to that um, um, a boy can't control his emotions. And then, um, but a man can. And, but, but, under, but underneath that is like, um, is this implicit thing that, okay, so a boy is, every boy is a potential rapist. But men are people who can, you know, can push, push down that impulse. That's, that's in that description that you gave. That's what I heard. Um, and so that, that song doesn't really paint men in a very good light either. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, to me, that goes back to kind of what I was saying about the lack of accountability. And hold on, I had a thought that I lost it. This is going to be a recurring theme the entire time. So uh, come back to me here in a few minutes. Okay. Anyone else? I'll just add just a little bit to that. Um, the one thing that I've heard um, amongst all the study stuff is it's, you know, men holding other men accountable. Um, how many people have seen, you know, their buddies with a, you know, someone that's had too much to drink or something like that. And, and I think there's a lot of that too, that needs to be brought out into the open, you know, is how, you know, you know, cause I guarantee you, if you're doing something wrong and your friend calls you out on it, then, you know, you're pretty much going to, you know, stop what you're doing or at least double think it before you do it. So <clears throat> that's one thing that I always thought we need to really bring more light into as well. Absolutely. And this song is Drunk Girl by Chris Jansen. I looked up because I can never remember. Anyone have anything they want to add? So um, how do you feel that the societal response is different when it's a male server of intimate partner violence who comes forward? Could you repeat that? Yeah. How does the societal response differ when it's a male victim of intimate partner violence who may come forward? or male survivor of intimate partner violence. So again, with my experience, I lost a ton of my friends at the time when I came forward to this. I've since have a wonderful support system and the best friends who understand and support what I've been through, but support me to what I've been through. But doing that and then also seeing the way that my experience is weaponized against women by incel types. Like, oh, well, men are, men are victims too on every single post 
where a woman or femme like comes forward about their experience, especially during the Me Too movement. It was almost the pandemic of toxic male BS that came out along with it. And seeing that with my own experiences and becoming a statistic for their BS has been one of the most frustrating parts of coming out and forward with what happened to me and my stories. Thank you for sharing. I think that dichotomy is something that is challenging to provide services and to recognize that male victim or males can be victims of domestic violence, but without feeding into that, it can be quite the challenge sometimes. Anyone else? Okay. How do you feel that society, or do you feel that society discounts intimate partner violence in relationships that are not um, like cisgender heterosexual relationships? So outside of that. Um, I've, I've um, seen police officers respond to same sex couples in a domestic and um, go there and calm, calm things down and then not do anything because if they're same-sex couples, um, they consider it mutual combat. Um, and then just just go, get back in their cars and leave. Um, um, one, one call I was on particularly involved a, a trans woman who had been beaten up badly by her cisgender male boyfriend. And um, I, I was the second officer on scene. So the first officer had already apprehended the, the suspect. And he told me to get the victim's information. And I, I was getting her information and realized that um, when she gave me her ID that she was a transgender woman and then um, got her story about what was going on. Um, and then I gave that information to the primary officer and he looked at it and she goes, she's a man. And then, um, and then he gave me back the information and he said, mutual combat, I'm out of here. And um, he let the, he let the, uh, uh, the, the suspect go. And um, I ended up, Reapprehending the suspect, and I put him in my car. And I looked up the domestic abuse statute, and it didn't say anything about, um, you know, who people are in a relationship, what their gender is. It's like they're in, you know, and this was back in um, 2000, 2002, 2003. And, and um, it didn't say anything about the gender in relationship that if they're, um, romantic partners and stuff like that and I thought yeah I mean um so I called my lieutenant up and I told him you know I got this um this guy and he beat up a trans woman and it's a, and I want to take him in for for on the domestic abuse act and my lieutenant goes why do you want to do that and I said because the victim is 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 very is beaten up very bad and so there was there there's that um, attitude among authorities, law enforcement and courts that, um, that transgender women are invisible when it, when it comes to that. And, and then that um, idea of mutual combat, you know, is, is, is a way for officers to, I don't want to be involved with this, you know, and, and, and I, 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 I would hope that it's better than almost 20 years ago, but I don't know. Um, I don't think it is, honestly. There hasn't been enough training. There hasn't been enough um, um, real talk about the LGBTQ community in Oklahoma City and in many agencies across the country. And so um, <clears throat> LGBTQ uh, people are often um, not given the same consideration and protections 
and are and, and are often um, hard to um, place in shelters, especially trans women. Um, a lot of shelters won't accept a transgender woman. And then um, a lot of times transgender women um, are not able to have had a, a medical interventions because they lack the insurance and resources, but there still hasn't been much of, uh, of effort to accommodate um, on trans women, particularly when they are targeted for this kind of violence. And the, the and it's very often there's a high level of, of violence against trans women in our society. And that's a reflection, I think, of a toxic masculinity because people who perpetuate this violence against trans women are often think of us as 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 easy targets, as 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 free as free targets in many ways. Um, to touch, to assault, to murder. Um, I have, I haven't been physically or sexually assaulted, but I've been touched many times um, by people because they feel like they have permission because because of uh, you know a trans woman is is not someone who is um, considered um, human, and we're objective were more easy to objectify and then it's not a whole lot different for for gay men especially people who are fey or effeminate and then um and then sometimes um the uh with lesbians especially um butch lesbians or trans men um the treatment of them comes down to oh you want to be a man and and then um they endeavor to treat them like a man. And the way that they do this is be violent to them like they would another man. Um, and so, um, all, like I said, for many reasons, we're, we're invisible to, to the law or to the systems, um, if not officially, but implicitly. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Anybody else have anything they want to add that comes to mind? Okay. So the next question, we've kind of circled around this a little bit already, but why might a male survivor of intimate partner violence be hesitant to reach out for law enforcement or to law enforcement for help if they're experiencing that violence? Yeah, for me, like I said earlier, it's I never I would never expect police to take it seriously. Again, I've seen the way that a lot of them treat uh, women in those situations. I've personally helped quite a few women get out of the home they were living in with that partner. He calls the cops, the cops show up and either tell us to leave and allow him to stay or does, is just generally dismissive and kind of an ass about it. So I'm not sure why I would feel any different in those situations, especially with how toxic a lot of police can be. And then also, I know this is a really touchy subject that's gonna ruffle some feathers, but there's a high percentage of police that are domestic abusers themselves. So there's, yeah, I just, I wouldn't see a point and I would feel less safe doing that. Anybody else have anything they want to add? I don't know how much I have to add to it, but I'm just curious as well about statistics. Are they skewed because maybe um male victims don't come forward because of toxic masculinity reasons or for not wanting to get the police involved and stuff like that I, i'm just curious if anybody knows i, I know there isn't a, a real number there but it makes me think that maybe the, the number would be probably higher if it wasn't for that in our society as well so I'm not a panelist, but I can give you some insight. Um, 
there's not a lot of research for male um, victims of domestic violence, like to start out with. So that can be really hard because a lot of the studies will show one thing, but then another one might report it as something completely different. There's just a lot of small sample sizes. Um, but one of the studies that I looked at reported that the majority of male survivors that did reach out for help and call a hotline felt like dismissed and they um, don't feel like they were helped. They felt like they were treated poorly by the service providers or by the people that they reached out for help. Um, and that kind of shut them down. Um, so whether it's, you know, do you, are you going to call the Women's Resource Center? Are you going to call the, what people think of like the Young Women's Christian Association or like the Women's Safety, like a lot of them have women in the title. Um, so they don't feel like they're accessible to them as well. So um, does anybody want to add to some of that when I kind of started? Well, it's altogether underreported and ignored. Um, and I don't I don't know how that how that calls out, but I've but I've 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 seen you know, I've seen both both aspects of that, um, where the police will, will go, you know, you need to man up and show her her place or just get out of there. You know, don't put up with that or, you know, just chew him out and basically, you know, um, tell him that he's not man enough and he, he ought to be able to make a decision and handle it or then trying to pursue things through the court. Um, if, especially if, um, if a man is trying to get a victim protection order against a woman, um, that it's more difficult for, for a man to do that. The, um, the outline of, uh, in, in, in court cases is, um, the, uh, the, the bias is, is for women in those cases a lot of times. And um, the men are expected to be able to um, be free to move on, which which is kind of um, what men are kind of expected to do in both in, in a lot of ways. You know, like in if they're struggling with their income, you know, you ought to be able to get a job. You're able-bodied. You know, um, you don't have any kids tying you down. Get out there, right? And then. Not, not a consideration for men who might be these in the parent and sole provider for their children. Um, it's they, they, they face those kinds of, um, of, the, of those kinds of biases, whether they're explicit or implicit. Um, there's also the expectation um, that men can just ease more easily move on than women can, that, that they don't need as much protection. And so, um, and, and, and don't get it when they need it. And then some oftentimes don't seek it when they need it because they don't think that anyone's going to believe them or anyone's going to care. And then I'll just a little bit to that too. I've seen people truly injured and I've probably been one of them once or twice in my life and not want to go to the hospital not want to go to the doctor um over major stuff um one time I was at a dentist office and they checked my blood pressure and it was outrageous and they said they had they were gonna have to call an ambulance first thought run <laughs> of course I didn't um but that was my first thought because I didn't want to deal with any of that um so I can only imagine with you know society, uh, friends, family, uh, whatever, maybe judging them on something as simple as a cut, I can only imagine that something is traumatizing, embarrassing, whatever it may be um, with abuse. Um, I can imagine them not coming forward with that as well, so. Anyone else? Um, I do want to add um, that, well, I'll add that actually after this next question. So the next question kind of builds, we've already talked about it just a little bit with that one, they kind of go hand in hand. But 
why might a male survivor of intimate partner violence be hesitant to reach out to help from service providers, whether it be um, going to like therapy, reaching out to a domestic violence service provider, trying to seek shelter or um, kind of anything under that umbrella? Yeah, for me, it was, it took, like I said, about eight or nine years, maybe a little bit more before I reached out to a therapist and tried to get help that way. And it was mainly because of the emotional control she had over me to a certain way that again, like the, no one else will love you, that kind of thing. And then she had this fear that if I did that, it would inevitably lead to me leaving. So she fought against that the best she could. And then for myself, again, it was just the ingrained toxic masculinity that if I do that, I'm weak. I mean, growing up with a dad who was in Vietnam and I'd say a lot of them never came back. There was always that, well, therapy is for like women. Therapy is for weak men, stuff like that. So for me, a lot of it was myself and not necessarily the situation. Anyone else have anything they would want to add for that? So I kind of mentioned earlier um, just about the titles and the names and things like that. Um, Casey actually mentioned in the chat too, a lot of, there's a lot of misconception that we only provide services to um, women or that much, many of the service providers are only accessible to women. Um, but the attorney general guidelines, the federal guidelines do require that any certified domestic or sexual violence agency provide equal services to anybody, regardless of what gender that they may identify as um, or sexual orientation and things like that. So if those are things that people experience, we would love to hear about them and you can always report them to the attorney general um, if it's something that you're encountering here in Oklahoma. Uh, but that should not be the case, but unfortunately, we see sometimes where people have had those experiences. Um, how do you feel that, or for the next question, sorry, um, how do you feel that domestic violence just as a whole um, is normalized within our culture? I think a lot of that too is just um, desensitizing. Um, like you see it so much. You see so many different examples on in movies. And um, I, I know a movie, uh, Paula said something about a movie with John Wayne in it. Um, there was also a, like, I remember as a kid watching a Clint Eastwood movie, uh, it was kind of along the same lines. Um, you know, you see these macho men, um, abusing women, you know, whatever it may be. But I think maybe it's, as a society, maybe we've become kind of desensitized to it a little bit. And so for some people, um, maybe it makes them look the other way or um, kind of along the lines of that, I, I guess, if that makes sense. And then there's, um, you know, going back, going back to culture there's these fantasies spun out by hollywood about how some, a certain man is with a woman and she's um kidnapped or killed and and then he goes on this vengeance and no matter what he does after that he's he's vindicated because because he's getting vengeance for the spoiling you know the the the, the death and of, of, of a pure woman and you know Braveheart is one of the best examples ever of that um, and and there's so many movies that conveniently remove the woman um, from a, a from a relationship from a family um, to give this guy vindication to to be a real man and so, you know, women are, make men are, you know, in the toxic masculinity sense, 
make men weak, make men uh, vulnerable. Because if you uh, if you if you attack my wife or my girlfriend or something like that, then um, you can really get my heart and really hurt me. And um, and so that promotes uh, some kind of uh, I guess emotional baggage that women are um, somehow um, block a man from being able to be his full self. So the tagline for Braveheart back in 1995 was interesting because, you know, I remember seeing the scenes of the movie and it shows William Wallace running on, on these high cliff ridges and um, not, you know, every man dies, but not every man really lives. And I'm thinking, what kind of life do they portray there? This life of war and vengeance and blood. And um, I'm like, I don't know if that's really living. That's that's not really living if you look at, you know, the way that um, trauma impacts people's lives and how damaging that is to the human psyche. Um, but that's what they're promoting. And, and so I, I think sometimes those kinds of attitudes contribute um, a hatred or, or, or a discomfort with, with, with women in relationships. And, and um, that makes a man want to be more uh, emotionally aloof and then more readily um, able to engage in violence to express himself to fully live um, i can go on and on about that but that's a lot of that toxic messaging that i think affects some of the movements that we see with the proud boys with the uh, oath keepers that they, they want to go on this quest like with william wallace and um, and they bring William Wallace up in some of their gatherings a lot. Um, even Ted Cruz fairly recently, you know, in the immortal worlds of William Wallace freedom, there's no record of him doing that. That's just the Hollywood creation. But this is the kind of stuff that, you know, it's kind of our new mythology that, that you know, once, you know, that's trying to inspire men to be fully alive but absent a woman or absent a partner. Absolutely. It gets really innocuous when we start really looking at the media and just, I notice it in songs and shows and sometimes it's really glaring and sometimes it's not, but we see it normalized in so many different ways. Uh, Anyone else have anything they want to add? Sure. So outside of media, I think that both like financial control in a relationship is far more prominent than we'd like to think it is. And then the way that can lead to codependency and other issues that just lead to this downward spiral towards abuse that, again, isn't reported because of that control. And I could see that being far more prominent in our society, once again, than a lot of us are aware of. Absolutely. Anyone else have any thoughts, things that they want to add? Okay. So earlier, um, We've kind of talked a little bit about like um, calling out your friends and kind of recognizing those behaviors and kind of how to um, kind of call out some of those abusive behaviors. I'm going to send this quote. I'm also going to read it, but again, I'm more of a visual person and this one is a little bit longer than the last one even. So um, if it's helpful to kind of review for your question to answer. Um, but on the issue of good and bad men, Hannah Gadsby says that self-proclaimed good men will often draw a line in the sand. 
they will draw a different line for every different occasion. They have a line for the locker room, a line for when their wives, mothers, daughters, and sisters are watching, another line for when they're drunk and fratting, another line for non-disclosure, a line for friends, a line for foes. Why, you know why we need to talk about this line between good and bad men? Because it's only good men who get to draw that line. And guess what? All men believe they're good. What thoughts come to mind whenever you hear and read that quote? True. Um, I believe for the majority <clears throat> of men, that's it's true. There's there's so many different lines to be drawn. Um, and like I said, kind of what I said earlier, it, it's going to be up to men to stop other men. Um, that's why I, I really do believe that that's where it's going to have to start. Um, and I do believe there is some of that seems to be getting a little bit better. But what I found, and I don't know if this has been mentioned or not, but I'm from a small little town. Um, this is where I went to high school. Um, I work at a body shop. I paint cars for a living. So I'm around toxic masculinity 24-7, basically. Um, but what I have found is when you reach out and shut someone down for saying something, whatever it may be, um, or they say something, uh, you know, something they're not supposed to is meant, you know, they want to share some emotions or something like that. And they'll either shut it down or they'll do the typical thing and just buy their lip and go on. If you actually sit down and have a discussion um, with most people, you will have an hour and a half, three hours conversation with that person. And it may be the first time that they've ever talked to someone about whatever issues they're having that they've kept in. So, you know, I always end up kind of being a therapist a little bit, you know, um, and that's fine because I understand it because I, I, I'm not going to judge anybody, period, but I'm not going to judge anybody for being emotional or whatever it may be. Um, but I truly believe that, you know, that's a, a great um, quote or whatever it may be there. But there are different lines because I guarantee you a lot of the stuff that I see and hear on a daily basis, those same people will not say that in front of probably the majority of their friends and family and you hear awful stuff. Um, so anyway, that, that's kind of my thoughts on it. I, I could keep going on that as well, but um, I, I think that's, like I said, it's just true. When people ask how can I be an ally to the trans community? Um, I'll often say, you know, um, speak well of us when we're not there. If someone is, is um, you know, talking about us and, you know, it's, it's spreading rumors or lies, um, you know, stand up and, and, and speak out against it. Um, and then when someone is spreading rumors or lies about, about women, so many times men don't defend her. And, and so it, 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 it perpetuates this, um, this attitude. Um, and also in that quote, what good men are, are good men are, good, are people who will speak out. Um, and, um, or will stop a situation if it's starting to get out of hand. Um, but in, uh, unfortunately, what immediately left to mind um, when you were saying that is um, the attitude that prevails among police officers. We're, we're the good guys. And, um, and, and the, they can't comprehend how, how them, when they take it too far, when use of force or the use of deadly force, um, because we're 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 the good guys. We're not we're not here to um, damage society. We're here to protect it. 
but sometimes like when you talk about that vengeance that enemy identified that um it, it, it it's taken too far because they feel they're justified and and but they mask it by we're the good guys the good guys are the people who would have stopped rodney king beating you know, there was not one officer that stepped in there and said, hey, stop it. They just kept, they either stood by or they participated. And then uh, just sometimes just one voice say, hey, this guy, this ain't like, it makes people self-conscious and uh oh, and they'll clean up their act. But some, but, but, but people can't even speak up against that. Um, um, a former friend of mine had heard people talking about me and spreading lies about me. And he told me about so-and-so, you better watch so-and-so. And then I said, did you say anything? And he goes, no, I couldn't. And he couldn't explain why. That's, in my opinion, that's not evidence of a good guy. Anyone else have anything they want to add about that quote or thoughts that come to mind? Yeah, so, so I love that quote. The especially the first part where self-proclaimed good men. It, it strikes me so much as self-proclaimed allies, which is why the term allies become almost worthless to me. Like when it comes to survivors of domestic violence, like personally, I don't want an ally. I want an accomplice that'll help me grow, who'll actually be there. Not just say they're there, not just say, hey, I support you, but actually put in the work. And I think this quote often like hits directly on that same point as well. Absolutely. So, We've got about five more minutes or so. So I'll ask one more question and then we'll wrap up. Um, so um, how do you feel that toxic masculinity differs in the way that it impacts both survivors and perpetrators? Or I can ask a different question. Okay. So um, kind of a, going back to that quote, we talked about um, not all men um, and kind of the difference between that good and bad men. And, um, you know, everybody wants to believe that they're a good person. Um, what commonalities do you see between like the not all men and like, um, things like the not all cops or not all white people or some of those um, disclaimers that we see as ways to kind of prevent ourselves from taking accountability. Yeah, I think in every single way, like you said, it's a way to skirt accountability and a complete lack of awareness of societal systems and power in this country and effectively the world as well. Like not all men, okay, but all men still benefit from that. Well, not all white people. We still benefit from the systems that harm others. And yeah, it's still, it still definitely hits a lot on domestic violence because we use those excuses to not even acknowledge that there's still harm being done. Even if it's not necessarily being done by me, there's still harm being done that I have the power to, I have a voice and a platform to help address and to hopefully help stop. Well, I think about um, the culture of silence. You know, we, we talk about the culture of silence a lot as applied to um, law enforcement. 
the blue curtain of silence, and that's a real thing. Um, the penalties for speaking out against um, the prevailing attitudes or to turn in um, an officer who's not, um, who, who, who's acting outside of policy procedure and the law. Um, more often, it seems like the person who reports that is, is punished more than the officer who is wrong. Uh, but we don't only find that in police departments, we find that in the medical profession. Um, it's very difficult for a doctor to get a doctor to testify against another doctor. Very difficult. Um, it's very difficult um, in, in professions um, across the board for people to testify against each other. Um, it's very difficult to raise awareness, even in the LGBTQ community, about how poorly uh, trans women and trans men are treated in the community um, by, by by um, the gay men and some lesbians, because um, and there's a backlash that goes that goes with that, and there's a there's a hushing and a silencing that that goes with that. I see um, I see also, you know, among politicians, you know, they're they're really free and able to you know hurl um accusations and all kinds of things at each other in, in during campaigns and stuff like that but but when it comes down to um actually testifying like in like at a like um at a senate trial or or a congressional investigation they ignore subpoenas that, that silence is is there it's expected it's valued it's seen as loyalty um, and that's the thing that we're fighting against a lot of times in, in, this, uh, in, in this toxic masculinity environment is to, um, is to get through that silence. And that silence is, is more the enemy in, in, than many things. And, um, and there's a lot of incentive to stay quiet. And, and, it's, and, it's, and the person who does speak up is demonized. Um, and and uh, maybe even um, character assassinated, and you know sometimes literally killed, oftentimes um, rendered unemployable. And that's that's the modern way of assassinating someone is nowadays is that they speak up is to um, make make sure that they um, cannot find. Um, means to uh, the means to support themselves um and, it, and that's that's apart from the um you know the that that um the sense of, of of what the a lot of people were you know talking about the the shaming and erasure of people who who speak out and who who are bad actors you know um this is the real, the real thing is, is, is the silence. It's, you can see people closing ranks um, and making sure that, the, that the, the essence of the truth doesn't get out. Absolutely. Anyone else have anything they wanna piggyback off or add to? Okay. Well, it is 4.30, so I do want to be respectful of everybody's time, so we will go ahead and wrap up, but thank you to all the panelists, so um, Richard, Paula, Josh, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to come share some insight with us and um, give us some your perspectives. Does anybody have anything they want to add in closing? I'd just say one quick thing real quick. First of all, thanks for, thanks for having me as well. But I think the big picture with the, the toxic masculinity that we see over and over again is, is a weakness. Um, men not wanting to, to seem like they're weak and pretty much every aspect that we discussed here, there had something to do with that. But, um, and I've seen it all. I've done a lot of it. it makes me a, a great, once you, once you do learn 
all that stuff that makes me a, a good teacher. Like, don't do that or don't say that or whatever it may be. But I really do believe that um, we do need to step up. We need to have corporations step up their, their training in whatever sector they're in. Um, I really do believe, believe in the workplace. We need to get better about training, you know, whatever it may be. I, I work in an all-male shop, you know, and that's where we can have these great discussions. But it's just so frowned upon. You know, so I urge anybody that has any kind of ties with corporations, small companies, whatever it may be, really get them to get involved in training their employees, not only in the skills to get the job done, but also this mental training. Because if they can get their workers right um, and be able to even just discuss their issues, um, it will also increase, you know, revenue on that side too so i really do believe that's kind of going to be a start as well so that's kind of all i'd say with that absolutely anybody else have any closing thoughts that they'd like to share well once again thank you all for coming to share or coming um, to the panelists for sharing and then all the attendees for for coming to spend the time with us. We do have another panel this Friday and one that will be next week on Tuesday. So you can find the event on the YWCA's Facebook page. Thank you.